Hello, I'm Mona, your host on Solutions, the lively show for people who had polio. Get ready to embark on a journey of empowerment and inspiration. We have episodes every first Wednesday of the month at 10 a.m. Eastern Canada time. Join us for the dynamic, informative talks about polio and your needs. What are your solutions? Join us. Hello everyone, I'm Mona, your host on Solutions. My subject today is ch, -ch change In the past, my mind moved my body, but now I have to listen to the body and the mind has to follow along. An old friend of mine told me this, Audrey King from Ontario, Canada. Everyone has to go there, no way around it. I stuck my toe in it and pulled my foot back immediately in retreat. Nope, don't wanna go there. Some of us just visit the space. We look in, others get stuck in the space. We find the space when we watch ourselves or our bodies experience change. Muscle strains from being a weekend warrior, bone fractures, a slight gimp in the knee, cataracts, infections, when our immune system can fight the germs all around us. Over the years, I ignored those irritating moments of instability, thinking I was just tired. I could just still go to that event. Yeah, sure. I will just rest tomorrow when everything will be fine. And yes, it was better. So the next day I went to do the shopping and carried all those groceries home. I didn't need anyone's help. And yet the very next day, I still went with my friends to that occasion where we walked and walked and walked around the exhibit hall looking for the perfect Christmas gift. Thinking again, tomorrow I will rest and just watch that TV show I love. I had those moments where when I stood up too fast, my legs didn't quite move at the pace they used to. Just ignore it, I kept saying, it'll go away. It always had before. How about that time I reached for the glass on the top shelf? My fingers just grasped it and down it went, the glass all over the floor. Yes, of course, I cleaned it up and went back to get another glass in the same place. Never thinking how much easier it would have been to just put that drinking glass on a lower shelf. None of these thoughts entered my mind because I was always so capable and nothing would ever stop me. I am invincible. As a child, I was told, you can do it. You can. And the more you do, the better you'll be. Well, they didn't know. The doctors didn't know. The physios didn't know. And most of all, I didn't know. No one knew or expected to have any further problems. But here we are, 20 to 40 years later, and we do have problems. <clears throat> when we go to the doctor and tell them, they say, well, I've checked it all, and you're just getting older, or just do some more exercise and you'll regain gain your strength. No, we found out that is not the answer. The answer is to change. Change what you do, change how you do things, change the way you rest, change, change, change. Life is always changing. Let's take the phone, for example. As children, it was mounted on the wall and then it had a cord and we could move it or even go into another room. Remember those secret calls in the hall cupboard as teenagers? Then along came the first cell phones, those huge two to three pound devices with limited distances and scratchy sound. Remember those irritating commercials? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? <laughs> As the years passed, it became smaller and more efficient. Now we have the smartphone and it is not just a phone, but a computer in your hand. 
is three inches by six inches. And the sound is amazing. The picture, incredible. These are the changes we welcomed instantly. So why is it so difficult for us to adapt to change in our bodies? Now, I will tell you, we become comfortable with what we have always done and using a different device to walk makes us think life will change, but we will not be able to do what we did before. But that's not true. These adaptive devices make our lives easier and better. It is just our mind that keeps saying no. The old way is better. Would you go back to the phone on the wall? I don't think so. Would you fry an egg on a wood stove or use the electric range where you dial the heat and use a nonstick fry pan to get perfect eggs every time? I think not. I'd like to introduce Jill. Jill is a clinical social worker and facilitator for the Colorado Post Polio Organization Support Groups. Take it away, Jill. Oh, Mona, thank you so much for letting me be here. Um, it's good to see you guys. I, when I found out you were presenting on change, the piece that I really felt fascinated and called to was talking about how we change. You can imagine as a therapist, um, a lot of people only seek therapy when they want something in their life to change. And oftentimes we want other people to change. <laughs> and if I could do that as a therapist, that would be amazing. But what we're talking about and what often is one of the first realizations when we start therapy is we are probably in the middle of some kind of change. Um, coming from a trauma standpoint, I will tell you that um, we talk a lot about the brain and humans learn by repetition. We are so wired to learn really, really fast this way. Our brains need a lot of energy, right? They just take up a lot of resources from our body. And so we have evolved to learn very, very fast so that our brain can spend energy on other things. Because you think about it, the brain has to think about what it's do doing during the day, but it doesn't have to think about swallowing. It doesn't have to think about breathing. It doesn't have to think about digesting. But there are things we learn. So once we learn something, we don't have to think about it. And then the brain can prioritize other, other tasks like problem solving, and being creative. One of the best examples of this is, I don't know if you guys have ever moved furniture around in your house and your brain has already learned the path through your house and then you move the furniture around and then what do you do for a week afterward? You run into it, right? Yeah, it's the same. It's also the same feeling as if I asked you to brush your teeth using a different hand. It just, it gives us that kind of awkward feeling of like, ooh, this is kind of hard, or ooh, I bumped into the, I bumped into the couch or the chair. So if you think of, if you think of your body as kind of being the room where the furniture is moving around, of course you're going to bump into things. And when something in our body changes, we have to learn to adjust and we have to learn a new way to go about it. And that takes brain power, which is why change is often something we resist and it's often um, something that's really, really exhausting. Change can be very exciting and other times it's really hard because there's a loss, right? Emotions are also signals in our bodies. And um, when we have to change because of a disability, because of something our body can't do anymore, there's a loss and there's grief and the changing also takes brain power. Um, I would, I would, I would also say, in regards to the brain, one way to maybe frame change is that um, we can consider it sort of a spiritual practice, right? It's not something where we do it once and we're done with it, right? When we move furniture around in the living room. 
we don't bump into it once and then we're done. We might bump into it a couple more times. So, so thinking of change as a process and having some acceptance around the fact that it's challenging to our brains and our brain will learn, but it is hard. That can be one of the best ways to take a look at and conceptualize like, oh my gosh, things are changing. Um, the last thing I would say is, well, I have two things. We can be very diligent in how we show mercy to ourselves through change. Um, I work with a lot of people who are so hard on themselves and that is adding insult to injury as my mom would say. You know, we, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves and we forget that really it's okay. This is part of life. We all, we all suffer. We all deal with change. And the final thing I'd say is when you change yourself, when you really notice, oh my goodness, I'm changing. I'm going to spend some time working on me. Everything around you changes. I talk to so many people who are in these impossible situations and they start working on their interior landscape, you know, versus wanting the whole world to change. And they notice that things get easier. So when we change ourselves, things around us can also change. And that would kind of be my takeaway. The brain is really wired to be able to adapt to change. It is tiring and change is always possible. Change is always possible. That's a very good byline. <clears throat> I think we'll, we'll use that. It's, uh, <laughs> well, that's very informative, Jill. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure having you here and you keep on doing the good work with other people with polio. Thank you so much. I love seeing you. Take care. <laughs> Take care of yourself. Bye for now. Bye. So let's look at what we can do for ourselves, for our loved ones, with our friends, how we make our lives easier, <clears throat> have less risk, and be better to ourselves. It's always difficult to do some of the activities others could do easily. I would watch my friends dance at parties and I would sway to the music, but never swing. Now I use an electric scooter and I can swing with my husband hand in hand on the dance floor, unheard of before. And I repeat, in the past, my mind moved my body, but now I have to listen to that body and the mind has to follow along. Audrey King's very wise words. We asked the National Library of Medicine here in Canada, growing older with post polio syndrome. <clears throat> what are the social and quality of life implications? Here are a few of the answers. Poliomyelitis, polio, was one of the most notorious diseases of the 20th century. Yet its impact and devastating consequences are a distant memory for many Canadians and everyone around the world. Between 1927 and 1962, almost 50,000 Canadians were infected with the polio virus, but that number declined drastically with the development of the Salk polio vaccine in the mid 50s. By 1994, Canada was declared polio free. And since then, Canadian efforts have shifted to focus on polio prevention. With polio on the brink of global eradication, often forgotten were the vast number of people who have lived with polio since the initial infection and those who are now affected by post polio syndrome, PPS. Post-polio syndrome typically occurs in polio survivors after at least 15 years of stability and manifests as new weakness. <clears throat> Central and peripheral fatigue, muscle pain, and atrophy of previously unaffected muscles. For this qualitative study, a focus group, methodology, 
with a case study design was used. Participants were recruited through Post Polio Canada, which is a program of March of Dimes Canada dedicated to the creation of peer support groups and networks of polio survivors. I can send this link to you, just write to me. How do we assess pain? The invisible long haul polio symptom. Chronic pain is a common problem for polio survivors. Nurses are on the front line to assess the scope and severity. <coughs> Ken, can you put up the picture? An impact of reported pain. I have an article describing how nurses can advocate for patients experiencing post polio pain. I can also send you a chart on the polio pain. There we are. It's a pain that shows how you're feeling at different times. What we want to be is at that yellow place where we're feeling good. We have no difficulties. We do a little something and it goes to the orange. We do a little more, it goes to the bright, brighter red, but we do too much like I described earlier in this conversation and I'm just sad and I cannot move. Backtrack, rest, it turns to a bright orange. Then you rest some more, it turns to orange. You, re you rest overnight, and don't get up and do your shopping, it goes back to yellow. Post polio is like that. It's on a pain scale. And what you do is write down how you're feeling today at nine o'clock, tomorrow at 11 o'clock, then again tomorrow at six in the evening and see where you're on that level. I can send you this pain scale. Just write to me. Thanks, Ken. Resilience is the process and outcome of successfully adapting to challenging life experiences, especially through mental, emotional, and behavioral flexibility. We need to be flexible, not just in our body, but in our mind. Adjustment to external and internal demands in other words, how do we try to slow down? The capacity to withstand or to recover quickly from difficulties is resilience. <coughs> I had a video um, on YouTube. I could easily send you the link. Um, it's very interesting, but we're not going to put it on today. I think we're just going to continue with our little talk. And I'd like to talk with Professor Mike. Mike, how have you changed? Well, change for me. Thank you, Mona, and welcome everybody. Here I am in New York. Uh, change for me has been drastic because I had polio in 1948 and I had non-paralytic polio and I didn't even know I had it because my parents never told me. So I lived an extremely active life uh, I played ball. I ran summer camps for children. Uh, and nothing was wrong. Uh, interestingly enough that I was a uh, polio uh, researcher all my life. Uh, I was in college and I'm still teaching. And uh, I knew all about polio and post-polio syndrome. The only thing I didn't know was that I had it. Uh, in 1948, in 1989, which is 41 years after I had polio, I began to experience post-polio syndrome. And that's when it was diagnosed, and that's when I found out from family that I actually was a polio survivor. So here I was lecturing to everybody on polio and post-polio syndrome and finally found out that I'm one of the group. So in, from 1989 until now, changes became drastic, and the challenges were incredible. I think the biggest challenge I think was for my wife because she saw me going downhill and she saw me trying, you know, with problems and she didn't know how to handle it. She really didn't know how could I have had polio? That's impossible. I would have known about it. I should have been affected years ago. 
And it took her approximately, I think, almost two years to finally accept what was going on with me. Uh, I think spouses and caregivers have a big problem. And I think uh, it's very, very important that they go through uh, education, just like we do with post-polio syndrome, to learn about what's going on with us and how to, ch and how to take care of it. Uh, the first thing I did was go into an AFO, which is a small leg brace. Uh, and I realized that my ankle wouldn't go up and down anymore. And therefore, I couldn't walk the way I could walk. So I had to get a cane. Now, people saw me at school and everything, walking with a cane and a brace, and they said, well, what happened to you? Uh, did you fall down? What, what happened? And I had to start explaining to everybody that I had polio. And they would say to me, gee, I didn't know that. Well, I said, I don't wear a badge on my shirt that says I'm a polio survivor. <laughs> I said, so So that was, the, that was the first part. That wasn't so bad. I got used to that, but I had to be very careful because I couldn't walk the way I could walk usually. And therefore, I had to make sure there were no obstacles in the house. Uh, I still didn't need any, uh, uh, any adaptive changes in the house at that time. But from just to give you an idea, from 1989 until today, I'm in two full leg braces. And I'm walking with crutches. When I got my first, when it got worse on the left leg and I got my first full leg brace, that became a challenge. And then I had to realize that change was extremely imperative. Uh, I had to get a, uh, a stair lift. I had to make changes in the bathrooms. I had to get grab bars all over the house uh, and make my grandchildren understand that grandpa you got to pick up all your toys because grandpa can't step over them or he's going to fall. I had to, like Jill said, your mind, you, when you walk into a place, you have to immediately scan the whole place, even in somebody else's house or your house, and just look around and see what could be detrimental to you and what can't. I think over the years, most of my friends know now that I'm a polio survivor. And when I'm coming to their house, you know, they, they ask questions. The other thing I had to do is, and it just happened yesterday when someone said to me, would you like me to help you with that? I said, yes. But when people used to ask me in the beginning, can I help you? Oh, no, no, that's fine. I can do it. Uh, but you learn after a while that you welcome them, you know, as long as they want to do it. And then always remember to say thank you. I really appreciate it because that's very important because then they'll ask somebody else because if you say no, 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 and you brush them away, they may not want to be there to ask anybody else. Uh, did I grieve about any of this? Uh, that's one of the things that Mona put on the list. I never grieved about it because I lived a great life before this happened. And I'm still living a great life now. Uh, there are certain, lots of things I can't do that I want to do. So did I grieve about it? No. Do I guess, pardon, pardon the word, Mona, but do I, I've gotten pissed at times that I can't do things that, that I used to do. I can't get on a ladder. I can't work around the house here. Uh, lots of things I can't do that I want to do. But I've just learned that if I want to leave, live a productive life, and go on. I just have to enjoy this. That's all. Uh, the other day, I mean, we were at a country house upstate, and the other day I was doing some work outside, and I just realized I have to sit down. I got to rest for about 30 minutes before I get up and try to do something else. Uh, I remembered when, after the cane, when I needed crutches, I want you to know I had the crutches in the car for almost six, seven months, and I looked at them. And I knew I needed them. And I knew that the cane wasn't going to do it. And I didn't want to use the crutches. Like I didn't want to use the leg brace when I got it. But I realized that the leg braces are absolutely wonderful. People wear glasses to see, like Maureen likes to say. People wear hearing aids to hear. I wear braces to walk because without the braces, I couldn't function. So for me, the braces are great. The crutches are great because now I can walk with them and I can do everything I want. Those are major changes to me because I didn't have polio as a child. Uh, I learned that if I, have to, if I have something to do, I make a list of what I have to do during the daytime. 
the next day. The lists are important. Because if I have to get up to see the doctor in the morning, I have to get up real early because I have to get dressed and I have to put my braces on and I have to get out of the house and I have to get to the car and I have to drive over to the doctor's office and stuff that I could normally jump out of bed, throw on my pants, jump into the car, do that. Now I have to get up an hour earlier to do these things. If I want to prep for something, I have to get up earlier and I have to do it. So I make a list. Those are all changes. Uh, the one thing I learned is that if I'm not feeling right, I'm not going to wait until, I'm not going to wait to see if it gets worse. Well, let's wait and see. Maybe the pain will go. I don't do that. I take care of it right away. I'll go to the doctor, go to the physiatrist right away and tell them, look, I'm having changes and I don't know where this is. Uh, I've been able to accept this. Uh, I never complained about it and I never cried about it uh, because I, I just still want to have, I'm having a great life and everything is wonderful. Uh, I get used to it. The fatigue, I think that's more on, on my spouse's side because if I tell her, listen, this is a, I, what I call it a polio day. I'm having a PPS day and I, my get up and go just got up and went. And uh, we're not going here today, or we're not going there today. And that's something that she had took time for her to accept. And then she'll tell me, you mind if I go? No, have a good time and go. But I just can't get myself to do this. Now, sometimes I don't want to go so I can use that excuse, you know, and she doesn't know what I'm doing. <laughs> However, I, I don't most of the time. Uh, it's, all, it's all adapting. And it's all challenge. And it's the biggest thing is accepting. If you accept all of these challenges that you have, you'll be happy. And life goes on. And we have a great time. And with braces and crutches and everything. And now my grandchildren understand. And everybody understands. And people see me like it is. And, and it's like for most of my friends and everything, I've had polio a lifetime. But it took all of these years for that to happen. And I don't have to explain it to anybody anymore because when I started wearing bravery, what happened to you? And then I go into, how do you tell this whole story about post-polio syndrome? And it's just, I had polio. Uh, one of my friends said, you never had polio. I mean, I, li I knew you, I all the, your whole life, you never had polio. Because they saw polio as people wearing leg braces. We grew up as kids. Kids in the street had braces, they had polio. So they figured that if I had polio, I had to have braces on my whole life. That wasn't the story. Uh, and I, <laughs> But the explaining part is over. I mean, if you just accept the disability, no matter how bad it gets, and no one can tell you, not even me, who's the polio researcher, if it will get worse or it will stay where it is, don't worry about it. Whatever happens, happens. Just accept it. Listen to your body. That's the most important thing. Listen to your body. And then, like I said, if something happens and it's not right, don't wait to see if it's going to get worse. Get medical attention right away. All right. Like I tell, like Mona used the telephone, I tell my wife, how long has the red light been on on the dashboard of the car before you're telling me about it? You know, I, I, you should have told me the moment the light went on. Now it's going to cost me a lot of money. So I don't want to go into surgery for something that I could have taken care of early on. And you should listen to your body. And if something is not right, just go take care of it right away. Life is great, folks. We're here. We're in a great age. We're in a great age of medicine. We're in a great age of everything. If you adapt and you listen to your body and you accept your challenges and always put a smile on your face, okay? And tell yourself a joke before you go to sleep at night. And remember, plan ahead for the next day and always focus. Always focus and you won't fall. Scan every area that you do and you'll be great at it. Thank you very much, Mike. That was a lot of very interesting information. And there are people with polio out there who didn't know they had polio. It's a very, very different way to look at things. And we all change in different ways. 
Every person who had polio has it a different way, and we have to adjust in our own ways. I'm going to talk a little bit about food. Protein foods help muscles repair. This is the best news. Work better to help polio people improve our abilities, especially when we're experiencing fatigue and new weakness. These foods include plant-based protein foods and are an important part of healthy eating for everyone. Include foods such as beans, lentils, nuts, seeds, lean meats, poultry, fish and shellfish, eggs, milk, lower fat dairy products. Enjoy them all. They're protein foods and they are good for you. Eat a variety of them as part of your healthy eating pattern. Protein foods have important nutrients. Check it on Google, the benefits of proteins. Hints to overcoming post polio. No slogan can ever say or truly understand what we are feeling. But here are a few from Susan Schoenbeck's words of wisdom. She's a nurse who had polio, who became a nurse. We just have to deal with it. That's my big one. Distract yourself from any kind of pain, but rest. Bring balance to your days and closure to your evenings. Be willing to be a beginner every single morning. Life becomes easier when you learn to accept an apology you never got. Almost everything will work again if you unplug for a few minutes, including yourself. And social self-care is really important. Connect with people. And now Maureen, Maureen has her own um, Zoom social group and we meet with her on the first, second Thursday of each month. And it's an amazing Zoom program. Again, write to me and I will send you Maureen's link to her Zoom meeting. But now Maureen has some hints for us before we close here. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Mona. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I am the co-founder of the Boca Area Post Polio Group, and we just celebrated our 28th birthday, anniversary, whatever you want to call it. So I had polio in 1953 when I was two years old in New York, and I never left braces. And Mike will tell you I'm the fastest walker on earth on my uh, walking with my braces and crutches. There was nothing that I couldn't do that I didn't try. And if there was a, because I had the will, I found a way to do it. Nothing stopped me. Uh, except that in 2017, my husband and I, both, we're both polio survivors, we were involved in a head-on collision and that just exasperated whatever we had left in our bodies. And so uh, we immediately, because our car was destroyed, we went to a ramp van. We had to think down the road, well, we're going to get, a, we need another car. What are we going to need, you know, in the future? And so we bit the bullet and we bought a used ramp van. And that ramp van to us has been a V8 moment. I should have done it long ago, okay? You know, people don't like to use assistive devices. Oh, it makes me look handicapped, it makes me look old, it makes me look whatever word you wanna say. But you know, in the long run, it's to our benefit. We The mantra used to be use it or lose it. And we all did use it and we are losing it slowly. And so now we need to look for those kind of things that will make our life easier, keeping us independent and safe in our homes. Because once we fall and we break something, that's it. We become 
we become a uh, burden to our families, our spouses, and perhaps not even being able to live independently anymore. So it's going to be liberating and, it, and you will find that you will have that V8 moment. I should have gotten that power wheelchair. No prize is going to be given. I'm still walking, especially if you're falling and breaking bones. It's, it's a no-brainer. And just because it's an electric chair doesn't mean it's going to kill you. So use what is out there. You know, 40 years ago, we didn't have half the things, the half the assistive devices that we have now to make our life easier. And you don't have to do everything all at once. It's not, uh, it doesn't have to be a daunting project. It can be a little at a time. You need a little help getting up from the toilet. Okay, well, maybe you need a higher seat. Maybe you need some, um, you know, grab bars or even over the commode um, seat that's got the arms built into the seat. Uh, maybe you need, you know, you have stairs in your house. A lot of people, you know, are still living up north where they got plenty of stairs and maybe you need a stair lift. And yeah, these things are expensive, but if you plan on it and seek uh, funds out there that maybe you can find to help subsidize, being disabled is not cheap. <laughs> it's not cheap. Um, you know, if you're, you need to wear braces because your legs are just weakened now, well, get them. It's not a big deal. The big deal is if you get them and then you say, oh, I know, and they end up under the bed, well, they're not going to do you any good. And if you fall because you're not using them, it's that's a big, big problem. Um Let's see what else did I want. You need to also pace oneself. You know, if you, instead of doing 100 things in the day, do 50 things, especially if you want to go dancing at night. Pace yourself. Nobody's telling you that you have to sit home like this doing nothing. Nobody's saying that at all. It's just a matter of know what your priorities are, what you have to do. And what you can leave for tomorrow. Leave for tomorrow. Um, using assistive devices is not defeat. It's actually liberating. I had a gal in my group. She fought the power chair, the, the scooter. She fought it. I was this close to taking it away because I said, she's an ungrateful wretch. And then I'm telling you, her heart was softened. She says, all right, Maureen. I will use the scooter. And if I tell you, she wrote me a really nice article for our newsletter about how liberating it was. And she called me and she says, Maureen, I took my garbage out for the first time all by myself. Something that was so minor that made such a difference in her life. Um. We, um, let's see, what else can I tell you? Um, you know, there are things that can help you open up cans. There are things that can help you, in a, you know, even lift your leg. They have leg lifters if you're unable to sit up in the bed, if you don't have an adjustable bed. They have this thing, I guess it's like a ladder. You tuck it in the bottom of your bed. It's got rungs on it, and you lay it on top of, of, of your blanket so when you need to get up, you just grab onto it. And you go like this as though you're walking up a ladder, and it lifts you up easily. If you're no longer able to transfer, they have Hoya lifts. They've got manual ones. They have electric ones. They have the kind that will... Uh, you can put a track on your ceiling and get you from point A to point B, whether it's from the bed to the bathroom to your to your chair. And I also found that I know a lot of people, 
you know, well, that power chair looks too disabled and I'm going to get a lightweight power chair or lightweight scooter. Well, they all look good, but they're still too heavy. And I know for me, I always have to hold on with one hand. And I don't care how light they say, oh, well, it's only 40 pounds. It's only 50 pounds. Well, if you're holding on to the wall or your crutch with one hand, that leaves one hand to pick up 50 pounds. And all of a sudden, that lightweight chair becomes, um, it may as well be 1,000 pounds because you cannot lift it up. You need to get a, a lift for your car. Doesn't have to be expensive. They have used ones out there. Um, and the scooters, I'm told, and it does make sense that with the three or four wheel scooters, you have that tiller in front of you. Well, your arms are always out in front of you, which if you have weakened arms, that will exasperate the weakness. So you need to perhaps think about a power chair where your arms are at rest at your side and you're leaning on your armrests. And all you're doing is three fingers to move the chair along with the joystick. We have to be our own advocates. And so on that note, I'm happy to answer any questions. You can reach me through Mona. And thank you all for listening. Well, Maureen, those were wonderful, wonderful hints. They're easy to try. They're mind-blowing. Yes, you have to uh, think about change. Write me for the pain scale. It's very interesting to be able to adapt to what we have to change with. Change is a difficult word. Along the way, I heard this prescription called the happiness prescription, and I'd like to read it to you. It's very, very cute. Take a few breaths. Call an old friend. Give yourself a hug. Write a thank you note. Sing in the shower. Go for a small, beautiful walk in a beautiful place. Forgive someone. Talk yourself Talk to yourself with kinder words. That is the prescription. And this was a little bit that I thought of to go with that wonderful happiness prescription. Look for the humor in a challenging situation. Mike, you taught me that. Imagine what your best possible life would look like. Be gentle with yourself. When you're afraid, know that we're all afraid sometimes. Notice all the ways that you're being courageous just by quietly persevering. Reflect on what you want in your care, what you're receiving, how caregiving is, friendships, family, the doctors that you have relationships with, and how you might achieve it. Identify some new goals that would help you get where you want to go. Get through the hard times. Acknowledge the difficulty rather than trying to fight it. Change, change, change. Thank you all. Thank you very much for coming to Mona Solutions the first Wednesday of every month. I'll see you in August. Thank you, guests. It's been wonderful.